This video was sponsored by Card Kingdom. You can visit their store by using my referral link in the description below. Hi everyone, I'm Nitsa Hone, and it's time for another MTG Top 10, the series where I usually rank cards based on their historical performance at Magic's highest level of competition. Sometimes, though, I like to look at the other end of the spectrum, and that's what we're doing today with a look at the worst multicolored enchantments. Generally, if a card is multicolored, it's designed to be more powerful than its monocolored counterparts. After all, if a card costs more than one color of mana, it's generally harder to cast than a monocolored card is. However, that doesn't mean that every multicolored enchantment we've ever seen is super powerful. In fact, some of them are absolutely awful, as we'll see in this video. While the cards that appear on this list and the order in which they appear is left up to my own opinion, there are some important things that have to be true about a card for it to show up on this list. First, it has to be bad in Magic's three main play modes, that is, 40 card limited, 60 card constructed, and 99 card commander. In other words, for a card to truly be considered one of the worst ever, it has to be bad everywhere and throughout all of Magic's history. To be eligible for this video, a card had to have the enchantment type and be multicolored. In all, there are 298 multicolored enchantments in Magic, and in this video, I'll give you my picks for the 10 worst of the bunch. At number 10, it's Suleiman's Legacy. For a red and a white mana, this enchantment destroys all Jinns and Ifrits when it enters the battlefield, and when a Jinn or Ifrit enters the battlefield, it gets destroyed. This sees the least play on EDH rec of any card on the list, so why do I have it at number 10? Well, because it has the most potential of any card on the list. Obviously enough, Jinns and Ifrits are not a very plentiful creature type. This was even true in Mirage Block, the most Jinn and Ifrit heavy format of all time. Even in Draft, you still didn't see enough Jinns and Ifrits for this to be good. After all, the three sets in the block had only 11 Jinns and 7 Ifrits, and many of them are rare, so even as a sideboard card, it wasn't worth it. Then, in all of Magic today, there are only 58 Jinns and 28 Ifrits, and that's nowhere near enough for this card to be relevant. But like I said, it has the most potential. If we ever end up in a world where Jinns or Ifrits suddenly get a ton of support, which isn't entirely outside of the realm of possibility, this could become a relevant card for the first time in its existence. So that's why I have it at number 10. It's really the only card on the list that has a chance of one day not being on it, but for now it hates on two creature types that largely don't matter, and that makes it one of the worst multicolored enchantments in the history of the game. At number 9, I've got Dragon Appeasement. Of all the cards in this list, this is probably the one I'm going to get the most pushback on. For three generic, a black, a red, and a green, this enchantment makes you skip your draw step, but you get an additional effect in exchange. Anytime you sacrifice a creature, you can draw a card. The ceiling here is fairly high, and there are going to be times where you can just combo off with this, but there's a huge problem here. Up front, this doesn't do anything, and you just spent six mana. And in fact, if your opponent finds a way to kill your sacrifice outlet before you go off, well, you're never drawing another card again. That kind of thing happens a lot when people play this card. The risk just isn't worth the reward. There are many way better payoffs for sacrificing creatures around that cost less mana and don't come with this massive risk. While it does see more play in EDH than any other card on the list, the fact it's only in 220 decks in EDH rec is worse than it sounds. Sacrifice decks are among the most popular themes in the entire format, yet only a very small percentage of them are making use of this clunky, dangerous enchantment, and even fewer decks should be playing this card. At number 8, it's Earthlink. It has the exact same mana cost as Dragon Appeasement, 3 generic, a black, a red, and a green. It makes it so that when a creature dies, that creature's controller sacrifices a land. You also have to pay 2 generic every upkeep to keep it around. This effect is entirely symmetrical, and therein lies the card's biggest problem. You just spent a bunch of mana to play this. That probably just cost you your entire turn. Your opponent gets to untap and take advantage of this before you ever do, most of the time, and that often results in disaster. Breaking the symmetry here isn't easy, especially because even after the hefty investment you pay up front, you have to spend even more mana to keep it around. Sure, you can choose not to pay it to get rid of it when it's doing negative stuff for you, but again, your opponent gets a whole turn to take advantage of this before you ever have that ability, so that doesn't really help its case. Plus, if you cast this only to decide to get rid of it on your next turn, you just lost a card and a ton of tempo. There will be times where you can line this up a little more effectively, sure, but kind of like with Dragon Appeasement, the fail case is going to happen too often for this to be a card you should ever play. At number 7, I have Primal Visitation. For 3 generic, a red, and a green, it's an aura that gives enchanted creature plus 3, plus 3, and haste. Auras come with a massive inherent downside, that being that they are essentially card disadvantage. Sure, you can make a creature bigger, but if that creature ever gets removed, something that happens all the time in Magic, you get 2 for one. 
If your opponent can remove the creature in response to visitation, you also take a massive tempo hit. So for auras to actually be worth it, they have to do something pretty impressive to overcome the downside. The good ones draw you cards, make creature tokens, or are so efficient that they're worth the risk. Primal Visitation doesn't do any of those things, and it doesn't even come close. Five mana is a massive investment for a meager plus three plus three boost, and that is mostly what this card does. I know it gives the creature haste too, but it will almost never matter. For the haste to matter, you need to get a creature in play on your turn first. How often are you going to have five mana lying around for you to cast this in the same turn? Not very often, and even when you do, you're probably setting yourself up for failure. At number six, I have Martyr's Tomb. For two generic, a white and a black, this enchantment lets you pay two life to prevent the next one damage that would be dealt to target creature this turn. Preventing damage is itself a fairly weak effect, mostly because it's only useful in narrow situations. And Martyr's Tomb is really bad at it, especially because it can only prevent damage done to creatures. Furthermore, it isn't even very efficient at what it does. Even though the activated ability doesn't cost mana, you have to remember that this costs four to cast in the first place. So you're actually paying four mana and eight life to prevent four damage, for example. That's not good. Sure, sometimes that can help save a creature or really annoy your opponent, but it just isn't impactful enough to make the cost of mana and life worth it in most situations. And number five, it's Reckless Assault. For two generic, a black, and a red, this enchantment comes with an activated ability that costs one generic and two life. Then it does one damage to any target. Pinging is great, right? Well, usually, but it isn't so great here. To do the first damage with Reckless Assault, you've paid five mana and two life. And sure, the more you use it, the more efficient it becomes, since the one mana to do one isn't a terrible deal, but you're also going to end up with very little life in the process. It did slightly get better recently with the introduction of Rowan Scion of War, but there are plenty of better ways to pay life. I wrote an entire article for Card Kingdom about building a commander deck around her, and there's no reason to ever consider running Assault with so many better options available. At number four, it's Suicidal Charge. For three generic, a black, and a red, you can sacrifice this enchantment to give your opponent's creatures minus one, minus one until end of turn. They also have to attack this turn if able. Giving all of your opponent's creatures minus one, minus one can be pretty significant in the right matchup, but there are lots of cheaper ways to do it, many of which don't involve you having to put a permanent into play first. Making all of your opponent's creatures attack you is a cool effect to add to the debuff and it's certainly flavorful, but there are many situations where you simply can't take advantage of the weakened state of your opponent's creatures. Sure, sometimes it can give you an opening to crack back, but there will be many more situations where this kills nothing, and forcing your opponent's creatures to attack you doesn't matter either. At number three, it's Spatial Binding. For one blue and one black, this enchantment lets you pay one life to make it so that a permanent can't phase out until your next upkeep. Obviously enough, this interacts with a little used mechanic, although over the last few years they have started to use it a bit more. A permanent that is phased out is treated as though it doesn't exist, and permanents with the keyword phasing alternate between phased in and phased out every turn. The idea with binding is to turn off phasing, and when looking at more recent cards that force permanents to phase out, like March of Swirling Mists, you can theoretically use it to ignore that effect for a turn. But all of these use cases are incredibly narrow, and when it doesn't actually encounter phasing, and even when it does actually encounter phasing, it isn't that great. Most of the time when you play this, it sits on the battlefield and doesn't do anything. And number two, it is Ghostly Flame, another enchantment that basically does nothing. For a black and a red, it makes it so that black and red permanents and spells are considered colorless sources of damage. So the idea here is to use this to help you get around a circle of protection, and sometimes that actually matters, I guess. But you know what? It doesn't really do much against other color hate effects for these colors. It only makes it so the damage those permanents do is considered colorless. It doesn't change their color. So your black and red creatures still can't block creatures with protection, and they can still be targeted by spells that are extra good against creatures of those colors. You basically have to line up exactly against a circle of protection or this does nothing, and those aren't really played anywhere. And at number one, I've got Malignant Growth. For three generic, a green and a blue, Malignant Growth is an enchantment that gets a growth counter every upkeep. Then at the beginning of each opponent's draw step, that player draws an additional card for each growth counter on Malignant Growth. Then Malignant Growth deals damage to the player equal to the number of cards they drew this way. In other words, this draws your opponent a bunch of extra cards, and it doesn't punish them nearly enough for that downside to be worth it. And for good measure, it also has cumulative upkeep one, which means you have to pay an ever-increasing amount of mana each upkeep 
just to keep it in play. This does mean you can get rid of this whenever you want, and you're probably going to want to the first turn you can, but that still means you paid five mana and a card for no effect at all, and you never want to do that. And that's pretty much this card's ceiling. That's what makes it the worst multicolored enchantment in Magic. So those are my picks for the worst multicolored enchantments in Magic. If you want to own any of these cards, check out the description where you can find a Direct Card Kingdom link for each card that appeared in the video. If you want to make sure you catch future videos, don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications. If you want to catch up on past videos, including many more that look at the worst cards in the game, you should see some playlists on your screen shortly. Thanks for watching.